TRT has just lumped in all this because a bunch of politicians in the late 80s thought they could, you know, save children and, and you know, save sports or at least make it look like they were uh, by presenting this, this law to the American people. What's up, guys? Welcome back to Think Big Bodybuilding Media. I'm Scott McNally, and joined with me today is attorney Rick Collins. Today, we're going to talk about uh, the changes with TRT. Is is the DEA trying to end TRT? What do you think? Is that that's that's the that's the tagline, right? Is uh, that's what everybody's saying, Rick? That, that's what I'm seeing online. You know, looking at social media, and thanks for having me on, Scott. Uh, looking at uh, social media, what I see is this this you know completely um, you know hyperbolic. Uh, you know, everybody's in in complete turmoil. Is this the end of online TRT? There was a post that uh, you and I have talked about by um, uh, a well known um, influencer who basically said that henceforth. Everybody on TRT is going to need to get a new script and see their doctor physically in person every 30 days. Yeah. And I know that there's a rule, and we, we can talk about that a little bit, but I was like, mm, that doesn't sound right to me, right? Well, I'm so, really glad, too. You know, I, I had messaged you a few days ago. You you had posted about this, and I saw that post. And when I saw that, I, I thought to myself, okay, this is some big stuff, and I, I'll say this as kind of a spoiler alert, guys. It's not quite as terrible as I thought that it was after I spoke to you. And you just did a column. This will be out in the next MD as well. And it's out right now on the digital version of Muscular Development, right. correct? Right. Yep. Yeah. Right. So you can, uh, you can go to it and, and maybe you can post the link to it um, and attach to this video so that yes. people can read. The, the new column that I just wrote to kind of dissect it a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think it's worth talking about. I think we need to put it into a context that makes sense. And I think a, a timeline on what this whole thing is all about is important. And that's kind of been lacking. Right now. Well, who better to have than, I mean, basically, we could call you like the legal steroid expert, Rick. You've been, I mean, I, I we, we've introduced you before, but for anybody who isn't aware, I mean, you you really started working initially, like a lot of your work was in steroid defense, right? And from there, you've basically, uh, you, okay, and, and you work with every aspect of, of bodybuilding, really, with the supplement companies and everything else, right? Yeah, I mean, I t I'm, I'm very blessed. I, I like to say that my, as a lawyer, my practice is kind of where health and fitness intersect with legal and regulatory issues. So if you're in the bodybuilding community, physique community, health, wellness, and, and there's legal issues attached to what you're doing, uh, I'm probably the guy to call. And I'm, I'm, I'm very blessed. I, I love my clients. I, I have a very busy practice. Um, like you said, I, I represent a lot of nutrition companies, sports supplement companies, uh, others in the, in the wellness and natural product space, as well as I do a lot of defense of, of criminal matters uh, and doping matters involving people who are either buying, using, selling, manufacturing, importing, anabolic steroids, SARMs, research chemicals, peptides, research. of different, the heavy, heavy quotes. So, um, so that's what I do. I've probably done more of that than, than certainly than any other lawyer and, and, you know, arguably more than most lawyers combined. So, um, I, I love what I do. It, it's good to, I may not be the smartest guy in the room in a general sense, but, but when it comes to my own little, my postage stamp of, of, you know, territory, I, I always feel like I have the, the advantage and, and that's good to, to good to feel. And, and I think my clients love that, that aspect as well. Hell yeah. Well, we are lucky to have you, man. You are literally the guy I would turn to with any legal questions, especially around bodybuilding, especially around, I mean, really, we are talking about steroids here as testosterone is a steroid. So where do we start with this? So so I, I guess the start is, is what's happening online right now. And that is that everybody is talking about this new proposed rule. So when the DEA wants to make, you know, to float out some changes in the way that a statute or a law passed by Congress is being 
implemented or effectuated, they will do a proposed notice of rulemaking. And they've on March 1st, they published in the Federal Register a proposed rule. And this proposed rule would impact controlled substances and the online prescribing of those controlled substances. And so obviously, it would encompass lots of different drugs that are controlled, but one of the drugs that is controlled is testosterone. So there's a 30-day period in which people can make comments to the DEA to say, hey, this rule's great, or hey, rule's terrible, or here's what I think is wrong with this rule. And so that notice is up. Um, the link to make comments is actually in the uh, muscular development column that I just wrote and Perfect. which you'll, you'll put to it can comments can come until the 31st. So that proposed rule was published on, on March 1st. People saw it and suddenly there were things in it that were very disturbing to folks in the TRT community because of the changes that it would make to the way that TRT could be prescribed and uh, obtained by people who are hypogonadal or who, who need TRT. So from a timeline perspective, though, that, that's what's happening now. But in order to really understand what it's, what it's all about and what its impact is and what its, its you know, purpose is, you got to go back, I think, all the way back to 1990 and the late 1980s, right? Uh, the, the short history is in the late 80s, Ben Johnson, 1988 Seoul Olympics, ran really, really fast in the 100 meters, got the gold medal. Canadian sprinter beat the American, Carl Lewis, and then tested positive for Winstrom. And the sports world went upside down. You know, this Canadian beat this American, all because of his cheating with, with an anabolic steroid. And so there was activity in Congress congressional hearings held to say, hey, what should we do about this problem? How do we get steroids out of sport? That's what it was all about. And so the members of Congress came up with this idea that the best way to do that would be to take testosterone and other anabolic steroids and just lump them all in together into the Controlled Substances Act, which deals with traditional drugs of abuse, right? Heroin, meth cocaine, you know, all the, the stuff that, you know, is is so terrible for many communities and for individuals because of overdose issues, because of organized crime issues, etc. So one of the cheerleaders for that, interestingly, was then Senator Joe Biden, who oh, was a yeah. absolutely, you know, driving the train to take testosterone and put it just force it into the Controlled Substances Act. I'm one of the people who thought, you know, that it doesn't fit. It's like a, a square peg, a round hole. This does not belong in the Controlled Substances Act in the first place. And lots of folks agreed with me. So at those hearings, there were representatives of the DEA, the AMA, the uh, FDA, even the National Institute on Drug Abuse. All of those representatives said the same thing. Don't. Don't schedule anabolic steroids. Don't put testosterone into the Controlled Substances Act. It's not that it's not the same kind of drug of abuse. It just doesn't belong there. It doesn't meet the criteria that have been established to make something into a controlled substance. Yeah. What did Congress do? It said, we don't care what you guys say. We're doing it because we want to save the children and we want to get it out of sports. And so in 1990, the law changed and made testosterone and all the synthetic analogs into controlled substances. Well, thank God so, they did so, that because they've yeah. completely wiped out the use of steroids since then. I mean, imagine what the now, world would be like had they not. <laughs> right, you know. As I've often said, right, supply and demand are, are basic economic principles. If there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. And when you shut off legitimate sources, what happens? Yeah. The black market. So, and it's thriving. Uh, it's thriving. Now. Right, thriving. And, and, that, and, and it exploded in the, in the years after Congress took that action. Yeah. So, so now you've got TR, you've got testosterone in this controlled substance status, not by act of the DEA. Again, DEA opposed it, but Congress wanted it. So in 2008, 
there was a kid, 18 year old kid named Ryan Hyatt. And this kid was able to go online and access a prescription for Vicodin um, from a doctor that he never saw, who never examined him, who never determined anything, and he overdosed and died. Hmm. And so that was brought to the attention of Congress, and Congress is like, well, let's make a law about this. So they enacted a law called the Ryan Hyatt Act of 2008, and it's an, an act that was focused on keeping opiates and other addictive painkillers, which are controlled substances, out of the hands of people who might overdose or get hurt. Hmm. So what it required was a face-to-face, in-person medical evaluation of the patient by a doctor to try to prevent these rogue pharmacies, these rogue sites that are just kind of out there making these painkillers available to folks without any real medical interaction. So that was the point of that law. The in-person medical evaluation imposed by Congress on online prescribing. Gotcha. So in 2020, suddenly we get you cut ahead now. So so now suddenly COVID nineteen comes, right? Yeah. Let's not and use that word, by the way. We gotta we gotta not use that word, unfortunately. But yeah. <laughs> what, what do we yeah, what do we use now? Right? We get we, yeah, yeah, yeah. YouTube does not like that, so I'll have to I'll have to bleep it. But yeah. All that right, happened. So, that happened. Yeah. Yeah, something happened. I don't know what it was, <laughs> but something happened in twenty twenty and suddenly there was a concern about people who had telemedicine prescriptions, prescriptions that were based on interactions with physicians far away. Um, And in the Ryan Hyatt Act, there are some exceptions to the face-to-face, the in-person medical evaluation. And one, if, if there's like this emergency we won't say the word, but you like can, a, we, can, a, we can say lockdown. We can say lockdown. Yeah, we can say you know, sort of a national health crisis or national yeah. health emergency. Right? So what DEA did in 2020 was it suspended its execution, its implementation, its its enforcement of the Ryan Hyde Act. So basically, that in person medical evaluation, we're going to put that on hold for a little while while this emergency is going on. So that's 2020. Now, cut ahead, here we are in 2023. Now, supposedly the the emergency is going to be over on May 11th of 2023, okay. according to the government. That's when it ends. So what so you're telling me is this is just going to go back to what it was prior to the emergency. Well, that's what would happen, I guess, if... DEA didn't try to get involved and change some things. Uh So what DEA has done is it's proposed a rule that would change things so that it wouldn't go quite back to what it was before 2020, but it would, by imposing some new regulations and some new red tape and some new rigmarole, that they would essentially be able to still even do prescriptions now without an in-person, but just for a limited period of time, right? So what the new rule says is that unlike before the 2020, you know, suspension of enforcement, right? Now can get a, a prescription for a controlled substance, but it can only be a 30 day prescription. Then you got to see your doctor if you want to get more. And the idea of it, again, if we're thinking of this whole law as being all about, not TRT, but being all about Vicodin and opiates, so basically you can go online, you can get a doctor through a, a um, interaction through the internet, but you can't get more than the 30-day prescription unless you get an actual in-person medical evaluation. Hmm. So... It's better than it was before 2020, but it's certainly there's details of it that impose a lot of 
regulations, restrictions, record keeping obligations on the part of physicians that are may make sense for Vicodin or for opiates, yeah. but don't make any sense for testosterone because going back, testosterone is the the square peg in the round hole of this entire legal structure, of the entire structure of the Controlled Substances Act. Yeah. So, I mean, the reality is this isn't an argument of, you know, should TRT require these things? It's really, should testosterone be on this list? Well, that's certainly yes. You know, and, and that's, you know, whether that ship has sailed forever, I probably would have said to you, if you'd asked me five years ago, Rick, um, will testosterone ever be taken out of the Controlled Substances Act or or brought down to a lower schedule below three, I probably would have said no, because there's really no strong constituency to do that, that Congress is, is interested in. But that's kind of changed because it's interesting because one of the, the big pushback um, coalitions against this proposed rule, which, you know, does add more record keeping and does require back to in in person, even if it's not for the first 30 days mm -hmm. after that, you do have to do the in person. Uh, one of the one of the pushbacks is coming from the trans community oh. because the trans community is looking at this as an anti trans proposed huh. rule that this is about denying trans, you know, people who were born uh, assigned female at birth and are now looking to become either more masculinized on a non-binary scale or ultimately to become men and, and transgender, um, that these people are being um, unfairly treated by depriving them of the most available and free access to the medication that would allow them to be comfortable in their own bodies. Huh. So I've read a number of articles criticizing the proposed rule, not just from the bodybuilding community, but from the trans community. And that has some, unfortunately, bodybuilding. We don't have a lot of power behind us, but I can tell you what, I think the trans community can get some shit done nowadays. Yeah. So if we have any chance, it's, we can, we can for hope for sure. them, we can hope for them to do it, you know? Successful in, in changing a lot of, a lot of cultural aspects that, you know, you never would have thought would have changed. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So let me understand this then a little bit better. Um, it, 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 there's a lot of companies out there today that I feel like, like the, the TRT, uh, like online TRT, the telemedicine stuff. I feel like in the last few years, it's gotten bigger and bigger. Do you think there are companies that have taken advantage of the, the, the changes that have been implemented since 2020 and have actually almost will say like been able to create a foundation for their businesses as a result of those temporary changes? Well, I guess if, if you got into the business while, you know, post 20 October of 2020, when, you know, the, there was really no enforcement of in person and you set up your business model, expecting that to go on forever. Um, I don't think anybody reasonably thought that would go forever. It was clear that it's an emergency exemption. So it's by definition, it's not supposed to go forever. But I guess if you set your entire structure up to, um, to, to expect that it would never change, well, now you've got to make some changes because now somebody does have to see this patient mm -hmm. in an in-person evaluation. Um, but it doesn't have to be the prescribing physician. So DEA has is offering in this proposed rule a number of sort of ways of getting around having to actually see the prescribing physician. And that can be seeing a physician in your state as a patient um, who is a DEA licensed provider in that state. And again, I don't think that the DEA is really focusing on TRT as part of any of this. I think they're thinking of it as opiates and, and painkillers. And so get seeing a DEA licensed physician in your state, you know, Michigan or wherever you are, uh, and then having that person do the evaluation of you 
and then interacting as a as the two of you with the doctor let's say in florida who becomes the prescribing physician for it that can be a way around the requirement that you ever actually have to go to florida so okay. so there are some of these these ways that dea is offering the problem with them is that some of them require you and your doctor to be sitting together at a video screen with the doctor in Florida. And from a practical standpoint, maybe these things make sense if we're really concerned about people getting addictive drugs that they can overdose on. Maybe maybe these things make sense. From a person getting a prescription for, you know, 100 or 200 milligrams of test, uh, you know, a week probably doesn't make a lot of sense. And even the 30 days doesn't really make a lot of sense when you apply it to TRT, yeah. you know. What, what real changes are going to take place in 30 days? Maybe it makes sense if you think about it from an opiate perspective. Sure. Or like an Maybe, but but that's really where where the DEA was thinking on this, and I think that the TRT community just because the TRT community just thinks about TRT, right? So yeah, it's all about me. It's all for everybody. Every every group, every special interest, everybody it thinks of everything in terms of how it impacts them. Uh, but this really isn't designed to impact them. This mm. is designed to impact other types of drugs. Now, the argument that given that it does impact testosterone, does that make sense? And there's some arguments that probably a lot of this doesn't make sense for that. And so that's why some people are pushing back and commenting to DEA that, okay, this is some of this may be great for protecting people from overdosing on, you know, on oxy, right. but TRT should be treated differently. And maybe there needs to be a special, a different rule with respect to the time in which to see a, a practitioner for a medical evaluation or, you know, other at maybe less of the rigmarole attached to it, less record keeping. I mean, there, there's silly record keeping, silly in the context of TRT, what time the prescription was written and when the interact, I mean, just, just stuff that seems like complete overkill. But, um, but is it the death knell of, of TRT? No. And don't forget, none of this applies to anybody who's actually seeing a doctor. So if you've got a local doctor who's prescribing you TRT, whatever it is, uh, at any dose of whatever it is, um, this is this doesn't affect it at all. If you see the doctor once and then you get the prescription, none of this applies. Mm -hmm. You know, this only applies if you've never seen a physician for an in-person evaluation. Interesting. Okay. So you mentioned the comments and that the, this comment section is open right now. You mentioned that you have a link in the muscular development online article. We're going to put yep. that link in the description of this podcast. That way I encourage everybody to go over and first of all, read the article. And then after that, click on the link and send your own comment. Uh, it, it, and Rick, how, how would you suggest that we go about this. I mean, number one, uh, you know, when we we're talking about it the other day, it's like you mentioned that, you know, we've talked about here, this is really about opiates. It's not even about us. So it's probably not going to help to just start screaming and be outraged uh, that, you know, I need my testosterone. That's probably not going to be the angle. What's the angle here? Yeah. So, um, well, uh, you know, a lot of people will be hesitant to even make a comment because this is a comment that's going to get to DEA and people are, <laughs> you know, are reluctant, you know, um, to, to speak to government, particularly, you know, the drug enforcement administration. So, um, but I, I think probably, um, people who are, who are on legitimate TRT and who find things within the, the content of this proposed rule, that just makes it very inconvenient, you know, and makes it tough on them, um, can say that. And TRT clinics that are having issues with it certainly um, can express that in a respectful way to DEA. Um, you know, uh, the, the last thing I guess I'll say is that, you know, a lot of people think that, and, I, and I've seen a lot of the comments, that this is sort of this extension of this war on men, right? Yeah. That this is that there's an ongoing war on 
masculinity um, and on testosterone as a as a emblem of masculinity as the the essence of masculinity and so testosterone and and masculinity are just demonized and this is an extension of that um that the government is against masculinity um there's something to that it, it, it is separate and apart from this rule i think you know when you look at for example the fda's black box warning on testosterone basically coming out and saying a few years back that testosterone causes, you know, heart heart issues and cardiac problems and all, all these, you know, um, cardiovascular uh, problems when if you re- actually look at, and I know you know this literature like I do, Scott, if you actually look at, you know, testosterone, it's, it's actually low testosterone that is wow. linked yeah. with more cardiovascular problems uh, than optimized, healthy, normal testosterone, even in the in the mid to high range. So, um, so I, I think there is a certain anti-testosterone bent in government that probably exists, certainly at FDA. Um, and I think culturally, we're in a weird place, right? I mean, we're we're in a place where you know masculinity and and sort of traditional masculinity is is demonized or at you know or at least kind of dismissed or 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 scoffed at a couple of years ago the american psychological association came out with the position that traditional masculinity is toxic really? is is probably yeah i mean so so yes there is this this cultural anti-male anti-testosterone kind of thing that's running through society at this point yeah. um but we have to be careful about then taking that narrative and putting everything that happens through the lens of that narrative. Because again, you know, this, the, the Ryan Hyatt Act, it was really not about testosterone at all. It was about painkillers. And DEA, by making this rule about that law, is also about painkillers and Vicodin and not about TRT. TRT is just lumped in all this because. A bunch of politicians in the late 80s thought they could, you know, save children and, and you know, cl- save sports or at least make it look like they were uh, by presenting this, this law to the American people. Yeah. Yeah. OK. Well, this makes a lot more sense to me. And it does make me feel like we are not being as singled out as I initially thought when I was just reading through social media. <laughs> Uh, this sounds a little more balanced, which is, I think that's at the end of the day, that's, that's kind of what the real story usually is, right? Somewhere in the middle. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Well, I appreciate your time here, Rick. I appreciate you taking the time to explain this to everybody. Um, and man, I encourage you, everybody out there, if you know, if you're in a good position to talk to the DEA, to make your comment, cause you have to leave your name and your contact information and all that. If you fill out a comment, right? <laughs> And to do that, um, hopefully the DEA will kind of rethink and say, you know, some of this is overkill for, for this particular drug, and, and maybe we can make some separate rules about it. Um, I'm going to keep my finger on the pulse of what happens. Uh, if, if anybody wants to follow me at uh, Rick Collins ESQ on, um, on Instagram, I, I tend to try to to keep new news and information out there by posting it on Instagram. So certainly follow me. I encourage your, your, your followers to, to be my followers and absolutely. Um, and hopefully, uh, we'll know uh, at some point in the months to come how this all shakes out. Yeah. And, and uh, like Rick said, guys, follow him for more. I, I hear all sorts of great news from you, stuff that I didn't see otherwise relating to bodybuilding, relating to anabolic steroids, TRT, and uh, and a lot of off topic stuff, too. Things that I wouldn't have thought about. But I, I appreciate your post. You always get me thinking. Thank you, brother. I, thank you very much. All right, guys, we'll go to the links, check everything out. We appreciate you hanging with us for another episode here at Think Big Bodybuilding Media. I'm Scott McNally, and I'm here with attorney Rick Collins. Rick, we appreciate your time, man. This is awesome. Thank you so much. Great time.